Hey, I'm David McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. Ed Bursk is an executive leader of digitalization, automation, and cybersecurity, which means the man knows what he's talking about. You and I are continuously transforming our traditional world into a digital world. We leverage technology for our convenience and productivity, but we also introduce great risks that we need to be aware of and manage. Join Ed and I for the conversation on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one. Ed Bursk, welcome back to the QTS Experience, this time in studio. Hi, it's good to be here. I'm glad you're here. We're here in our uh, Ashburn uh, studio and... Um, for some reason, we were able to persuade you to come back in, and I'm glad because there were so many things I wanted to dive into. We didn't get a chance to. Uh, last time we talked about digital twins and digital threads, which was fascinating, and that was a really cool conversation all itself. But just before we came on camera, uh, and I was trying to say uh, part of your title, which is Head of Digitalization, nailed it, yep. Automation and OT uh, Cybersecurity. What Help me to understand. We were we were kind of kicking around digitize and digitalization, and you were reminding me of um, this really cool phrase that you you presented last time we were talking. And so, what can, can you can you talk again about to what it means to you? What the differences between those things are? Well, I I don't remember what phrase I used. You know, I have a. Dave was amazing is how I think it started. <laughs> okay. That's great. Yeah. But uh, I was just going to joke that uh, I, I don't always remember what I say. I, I, I do have a lot of sayings. Uh, one of them is that I never lie. That mm. way I, I never have to remember what I say. That's a good idea. And the corollary is I never remember what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, something becoming digital uh -huh. and and then digitalization right that right. was that was a topic of you know of conversation and, uh -huh. and it's something that we hear from time to time um, you know frankly more a couple of years ago than now but still it comes up because mm -hmm. you know and I think the example I may have used last time was you, you take a picture and you scan it in and mm -hmm. it's digital right so so but what did you do to make it digital there was a process you went through. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds silly for a picture, right? But imagine right. a business or some kind of function that needs to do that. Um, and, and you're going to want to maybe even automate that, right. that process uh, to make it more efficient or right. to be able to scale it up. And, and so when you think about it in that way, the entirety of bringing all of that you did mm -hmm. into the digital realm, that's, to me at least, mm -hmm. digitalization, mm -hmm. right? So the entirety of it. Uh, I mean, you know, we talked about cars the last time too, yeah. I think, a lot. And, and we talked about it to give an example, I think at least once, uh, of, of designing a car. And everybody knows, oh, you have CAD tools and mm -hmm. engineering tools and, and other things that help you design the car. But, but what manufacturers do today, and they've mm -hmm. been doing it for years really, is, mm -hmm. is they also design how they're going to produce it. Mm -hmm. And so the entirety of all that, mm -hmm. you can have, you know, the digitalization and you can optimize how you're going to do both the design process, by the way, as well as the production, mm -hmm. uh, and then actually go and instantiate it in the real world. So, so, so now you can then take advantage of modern automation mm -hmm. technology and you can really have, you know, a, a fantastic process, right? That, that mm -hmm. you know, really is, is faster uh, and more accurate and, and consumes less energy, a lot of benefits uh, than what you had years before. So to me, that's what, when we talk about digitalization mm -hmm. and automation, that's what we're talking about. So we talked about um, digital twins and digital threads, but where my mind's going now that I, I, I really didn't even consider last time, this microphone's fighting with me, that's okay, <laughs> is um, when you talk about automate the process, so I've, I've taken my CAD or my tools or whatever, I create whatever it is that I'm creating, airplane, car, building, it doesn't matter, but let's just say a vehicle. In this analogy, are you saying that then I could also create the digital, um, you know, how is it gonna move down the assembly line? How is it gonna move into storage? How is it gonna get onto the railhead or whatever to get to its destination? Like the, in, not just the production of the vehicle and I can literally create a, <clears throat> a virtual twin or a virtual world of this thing moving through this yep. entire process. Really, what do we, 
Do we do we do that with any particular industry from from conception to customer turnover in any industry today that you know of? Yeah, a lot of manufacturing has really, you know, gotten down that <clears throat> path, right? And that was sort of another topic we touched on a while back, which was, you know, where people are in their digital journey, if you will. Right. I know that sounds a little trite nowadays, but but in fact, people are still implementing and, <clears throat> and progressing there. Mm. But yes, I mean, most, um, you know, if I said, well, you know, a car designer, a shipbuilder, someone who makes toys, whatever it is, mm -hmm. they use a CAD program, you go, well, of course they do. Right. Right. But that wasn't the case decades ago. Right. right. I mean, that, that came on, you know, very heavy in the 70s and 80s and so on. Right. Um, and I'm sure people will correct me on the dates, but that's right. close enough probably right. for our conversation here. Uh, but the point is that all the other things we just talked about, mm -hmm. right, that, that has been coming on pretty strong over the last uh, few years especially, but certainly over the last decade. And, and so you have many different manufacturers that have implemented some level of that, not mm -hmm. necessarily all of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, today we talk about IoT mm -hmm. and, and, and companies like I work for, mm -hmm. Siemens, we talk about you know, industrial Internet of Things because that's mm -hmm. the business we're mm -hmm. in, right, industrialization. Right. Um, but – not everybody is really doing that today. Mm -hmm. You don't have, you know, broad, massive deployments of IoT. It's, right. it's something that we've been working on for years. Right. We used to call it, you know, machine to machine, and we had telematics and other things that were, you know, communicating. In other words, it wasn't people communicating right. like we are. It was machines communicating. <clears throat> right. And, and now coming back to the factory, right, that's what's happening more and more is machines are communicating Mm. And and in your business, mm -hmm. right, in, in the QTS and data mm -hmm. centers, mm -hmm. all the things you enable for customers, there's, mm -hmm. you know, thoughts of edge computing and getting the computing closer to where the action's happening. Right. Well, that's starting to happen in manufacturing now, too. Mm. So that's bleeding into the automation side, right? But mm -hmm. in terms of that digitalization, yeah, a, a lot of companies and a lot of industries, food and beverage, all sorts of things are well down that path mm. because it has a lot of benefits, right? What when you're talking about um, business IoT, so I've had a lot of IoT folks on. I, I love the conversation. Half of it's usually really fun and cool and look at all the potential. The other is usually the other side of the coin. Look at the dark surveillance. You know, what happens if data gets loose? Um, I don't know where this conversation will go, but I'm curious. When you think business IoT, um, what are some of the, because uh, let me back up. The, the folks that I'm talking to, they, they are also business IoT, but it's as much, um, they also talk a lot about commercial IoT or um, uh, um, civilian or residential, whatever you want to call it. Um, and one of their concerns is, well, I suppose for either groups is that <clears throat> you go to a big box store, you get your IoT device for your office or your home uh, you don't have a, you know, you just plug it in, you turn it on. It doesn't occur to you to change the standard password. So they introduce a lot of security vulnerabilities or they don't know how to optimize it. Is that, it seems to me like what you're describing is a completely different level. It's the same kind of big idea of we want the telemetry, we want the data, we want this thing to tie into a system so that it can work with other machines mm -hmm. sure. to optimize, whether it's automation or whatever. <clears throat> But somebody just doesn't go get it off the shelf and plug it in and turn it on. Like there's a, I gotta believe there's a whole process to make these things secure and part of a, an ecosystem. It, or, it, is that true, or how would you describe it? Well, the, you know, I'm I'm tracking right along with you yeah. until that last part, which is a little <laughs> aspirational, right? You know, so we we want it to be secure. We need it to be secure. Right. And that and a lot of people are working on that today. I can I can tell you, but but <clears throat> that's the part that's sort of lagging a little bit and. And it has to be secure, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're in someone's factory and someone's production facility, repair facility, especially if there's some safety aspect, mm -hmm. either on the product they're working on or how they have to build a product, right? Right? You know, Siemens builds, you know, big gas turbines, right? Um, you know, bolts the size of your leg, right? right? You know, the, the right. whole turbine's the size of your house, right? right. Um, bigger maybe uh, than mine. <laughs> and uh, and in fact, there's a power plant not far from here. One of their customers has spun up that's delivering, I don't know, 800 megawatts. Right. Right. I mean, these are big things. And so, you know, you have safety concerns in that kind of manufacturing, right? right? So, Wait a minute. The wind tower is delivering 800 megawatts? No, these are natural gas. Oh, natural gas. Okay. Yeah. No, no. I was like, uh, holy cow. Oh, no. Uh, out in the Midwest and yeah. Texas and wind farms? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, gigawatt. 
But that's the whole farm. That's not yes. any individual no. turbine. Okay, that's no. what I thought for a second. I was no. hearing. I was like, we have a turbine that's doing eight hundred megawatts. I can't even. It's, it blades the size of the Titanic out there. So well, they're getting bigger. That's yeah. maybe a subject for another. Yeah, day. for another conversation. <laughs> that's okay. But yes, I mean, I've you know, so I've been, for example, to to uh, to the Siemens Charlotte mm-hmm. uh, factory, mm-hmm. uh, and you know, these things are are huge. Right. right. I mean, it's really impressive. There's a hundred ton crane at the top of the factory. Right. Right. Um, so you know you have safety concerns in that kind of manufacturing, mm-hmm. and and so you, you you know you really have to understand what you're doing, and if you're going to introduce technology mm-hmm. into a manufacturing process, you have to you know feel first of all it's going to accomplish the mission, it's going to do that you know accurately right. and safely, but also you you can't have it you know attacked if you will, right. and and that was that third part of my title right, right. which is OT. Cybersecurity and OT, right. we, we talked about last time, is operational technology to distinguish it from IT. Right. And um, and in the government world, you also hear ICS, industrial control systems, right? right? So these are, these are, you know, different types of animals. Yes, you know, there's computing power and there's software inside mm-hmm. and firmware inside, but, right. but they're sort of built a little bit differently, right? right? And so, therefore, they, you know, operate a little bit differently. They have different characteristics. And all the wonderful digitalization and automation and all the wonderful IoT stuff that we'd like to do, it's kind of, and, and this may be repeating myself from last time, but it's kind of all for naught if you don't have it cyber secure. Right. So out of the gate, you have to know that you're going to be able to get there or it's kind of challenging to think about doing it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How, how, look, it seems like we've been warned since the day we could plug <laughs> in a device that could connect to the quote unquote internet that this is risky business. I've said many, many times, the NSA, director of NSA, about a decade ago now said, this will be the greatest transfer of wealth in human history because of malware. Um, Since our last conversation, the uh, pipeline has been interfered with and resolved. They had a ransomware attack. There have been other attacks, and I'm sure in your industry, you hear way more than the population does. I re- remember, um, and I've spoken about it before, going to an ethical hacker conference in New York City a number of years ago. <clears throat> and it was really, really cool, and it was really, really scary because the people there, at least what they espouse, were very much for um, <clears throat> how do we help fight against the tide of hacking? Mm-hmm. And um, their organization was about that. And these were young, cool, this was not uh, people that look or sound like me, and the examples they were giving were the breaches at hospitals, medical facilities mm-hmm. um, that were costing people's lives and money and whatever. And this is a really interesting conversation. And that was four years ago now, three years ago. And um, <clears throat> and most of those conversations never make it to the news. Most of those attacks, they're, they're not public for a wide variety of reasons. But it's been on everybody's mind for quite some time. And mm-hmm. now we've got these very public ones to just the regular, po- you know, general population. I'm sure there are plenty that move through industry. How, as, as you evaluate, and a number of the things we're going to talk about, whether it's automation or robotics or digitalization or cybersecurity, the overlay over all of that is how do I make these things secure, which is to say they've got to be able to do their function without interference um, or accurately or as intended. But I can't at least have them stop from doing their job or even worse, it appears they're doing their job in the medical world and they're not. You well, know, they're, and in many other worlds. And too. in many other worlds, right? Yeah. Yes, I'm validating the integrity of that bolt that's going into the wing of a plane. Or the chemical level in the water plant or the chemical level in the water plant, and it looks, according to the reader, that everything's good when everything's not good. So how how do organizations in your industry staff for that? How do you train for that? How do you, you know, where is it on the priority stack of, because it seems like, where do you start? Is it where you build? Is it um, how you operate it? Is it how you protect it? How do you process through those priorities? Well, you know, so the answer is yes. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a it's a daunting problem, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and uh, you know, I, I've actually been involved in you know in 
as we talked about last time, you know, IT and <clears throat> cybersecurity and networking and, and, you know, technology and automation and so on, right. you know, for, for decades and, right. and, you know, back into the eighties. Right. Ooh. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, back then I actually was, uh, you know, a practicing engineer, if you will. Uh, now I think I may have also used this joke perhaps offline, but, you know, now I'm the kind of an engineer that other engineers laugh at. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I have a clue. Welcome to the club. <laughs> exactly. I, but I'd like to think I have a clue, right. you know, which, right. end, which end is up, you know. Right. Uh, you know, as a, as a, as a former, uh, you know, electrical engineer, I know which end is sparky. Right. right. That's which right. Which end's dangerous, right? So, so, so the point is it's a daunting problem. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, IT and OT, I mean, one of the sort of basic things was um, – and, it, and it's becoming less true, which is good. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, years ago especially, you would see IT. You know, you started realizing, wow, this could be uh, an issue. We've got intellectual property essentially there. Uh, it could be under attack or, mm -hmm. or maybe now you're realizing it's constantly under attack. Right. Um, so you're going to protect the data. That was sort of the paramount thing. Protect the integrity of what you're operating. Right. The factory's mission Right. And, mm. and, and remember, this is not an unfair statement. This is just reality. Right. Factory's mission was make the product. Right. Get the product out the door. Right. Whatever that product was, whether right. it was repairing an aircraft or whether it was making a widget, you know, whatever it was, because that's how they're judged. Right. right? That's how they're paid. Right. Um, and so, so, you know, number one item wasn't protecting the data, but the data is driving the process, right? Right. The data is the intellectual property. And so, and so if you will, the OT world is certainly caught up with the awareness. That's not right. the issue. It's just, how do you, how do you do that? So, um, you know, in the old days, quote unquote, you'd think about, well, I can, I can wall it off. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 don't know if I brought this up in the past, but you know, I, I had a conversation with a, a CIO for a major company who basically was doing one of those really sort of smart things, is doing a little bit of a walkabout, right? Mm -hmm. Going around, seeing how things were going. Right. And he goes, there, there I was, um, and I'll, I'll just say this story in a slightly different way because mm -hmm. their, their, right. their business is their business, mm -hmm. right? But, but he was on the factory floor, mm -hmm. I'll just call it, and, and he watched a young engineer uh, walk up to some of the operational technology on the factory floor that was being updated, and he mm. plugged a memory stick mm. into that equipment, and he loaded some new firmware in, mm. and he tidied up, and you know, waved, and went back to his desk. Mm -hmm. Had violated zero company policies, mm. right? But had just walked through the firewall right. that the CIO <clears throat> thought was around the factory floor. Right. He he went from the IT world right. to just, the OT world. Just breached it. Yeah, didn't violate a policy, right. but but had breached it, right? right? And and that 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 he said that really made me think about what we were doing and how we were doing it. That 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 you know, drawing a line around it, firewalling it, right? You know, even with the best technology, might not be enough, right? Right? You had to have a much more comprehensive look at it, and very smart observation on his right. part, right? Because that's in fact. You know, just one misconfigured device can let you through yeah. even the best defenses, right? And you know, you know, to quote myself, excuse me, right? But you know, everybody's offense is better than their defense, right? It's um, I've used the analogy before, but it works so well. I'm going to use it again, or not analogy, actual story. And that was um, uh, to to make it really short, a, a organization has created a way to simulate an operating room mm -hmm. with material, not a cadaver, but in a material on a human size frame. So that such that when you cut into it and you mm -hmm. work on the organs, it's very, I think it's like, like a gelatin type, but it's very, it reacts to the blade. It reacts to the manipulation and the frame as close as we possibly, as close as we can right now to an actual human being. It's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And depending upon what they're simulating, <clears throat> um, it could be a surgery, it could be cardiac arrest, whatever. But what the organization was trying to demonstrate through the context of this exercise was the vulnerability to that genius team to technology. Mm -hmm. So the technology is alerting the team to the condition of their patient while they're performing their procedure, whatever it is. And they had the technology start telling them, um, this person's cratering, something's going wrong. Mm -hmm. And they immediately start responding. 
So as they start responding with medicines and reaction and procedures and whatever, they're responding to a false positive. Mm -hmm. So it causes, so the result they're expecting from this patient is not the result they're getting. They're actually causing where there was no harm, they're causing harm. And so Mm -hmm. it goes, and again, they're relying on these machines and they eventually lose the patient. Whatever the failure of the exercise, I don't know if the patient died, but, but it got into this dangerous zone. So they reset now, they didn't tell any of the people what the exercise was. It's just like a flight simulator. Mm-hmm. They're not telling them that the gauges are wrong. That they're not, you know, they're just, here comes the here comes a something at them. They're reacting to the controls in front of them. So they do this several times, whatever the number is, when somebody finally guesses, what if it's the machine? Mm-hmm. What if the machine's been compromised? So they... They're like, aha, here we go. So they grab that machine, whip it out of the room, run over to the storage closet, grab another machine, plug it in, away they go, ha ha, only to fail again. What they didn't do was check the firmware Mm -hmm. because in this scenario, the way that it started based upon a real life situation was a lot of systems came in, were plugged into the interweb, not behind a firewall or any other security. They were immediately compromised. Um, Nobody went back to check them. And they had a storage of their standby machines. So if machine one failed or was determined to compromise, well, that's okay. I've got these others that aren't plugged into there, but they all were at one point. And you didn't do any you know, checksums or anything against them to validate the firmware and the integrity of the code. And, yeah. and what the right answer in that case was disconnect the machines and have a human being monitoring and doing or validating um, and it was go back and wipe the machines and in a secure manner um, update them and then check them with, you know, you've got to have some control mechanism. Yep. And it just showed how, um, again, on a real life scenario, how our systems that we trusted had been compromised and they weren't stealing data. There was no um, uh, virus running through there or whatever it was uh, was uh, um, uh, it it had been it, it I shouldn't say there wasn't a virus there wasn't a virus that was spreading and infecting other things it was a download code that had infected it and um, there was supposedly a ransomware event tied to this but the people who were trying to do the ransomware screwed up the email or whatever the circumstance was that they presented mm-hmm. the 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 main story was these genius medical people didn't have the ability to validate the machines and the technicians were understaffed and busy and whatever. It was very understandable, but it was still very scary and very vulnerable. And and that's the world we're seeing now is, you know, we used to think that, well, we've got to protect them from a data breach, from taking data. Not necessarily. I just need to stop data from moving or you to be able to access, turn something on, well, turn and, it and, off. And now, and now you're kind of getting to the, in a sense, to the modern world. So first of all, I mean, I'm sure the medical folks learned a lot from the exercise, right? Did. Which was what, you know, what, what inputs they could depend on. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, the, now, but now your, you know, your story relative to cyber is coming sort of to the zero trust world that we want to get to, right? right. And, and the fact that, you know, again, OT is different just in the types of equipment and how it's implemented and so on, which overlaps your story here, right? right? I mean, but there are, there's a lot of commonality and, and, you know, sort of coming back full circle to your question, Right, you know, you have to have a method to your madness here, right? You you have you can't just sort of allow software and firmware to be updated without understanding what you're doing and, and so on and so forth. And and this it's the same case with the factory example right. we talked about before. So so what do you do? Well, I mean, in in one sense, basic cyber hygiene, that's where you start because mm-hmm. again, it's a daunting problem. Right? Mm-hmm. How do you deal with all these different variables? Well, mm-hmm. who was operating, uh, you know, IT? Who was who was responsible for updating those medical devices and and so on and so forth? But you you have to have, you know, a, a process there. And and in fact, there 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 are well known frameworks for that um, uh, available from you know from you know folks like NIST and and, and standards bodies like IEC mm-hmm. uh, and, and so on, so that you don't have to. You know, struggle with understanding. Well, what should I? What should I generally be doing? And then, mm-hmm. what should I specifically be doing? Mm-hmm. A lot of companies can advise you as well. Mm-hmm. But the basics are: you, you, you first have to understand what you've got. Mm-hmm. You, you can't protect what you don't know about, mm-hmm. right? So you, you 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 asset. You have an inventory of all your assets. Mm-hmm. And you have to manage them actively, mm-hmm. right? Because you may need to patch things and so on. I mean, I'm sure it all makes sense. You do right. this in the data centers, right? right? You have to keep, you know, the the, the equipment 
uh, up to date. Well, you also keep your data center up to date, right? right? You know, the environmental controls and everything else. Uh, and that's akin to your medical devices. You, you have to understand what you're feeding them, right? right. You know, good power, good environment, and good software, right? right? Uh, and so once you, you know, have a handle on your assets and you're actively managing that, then you can try to understand what could the vulnerabilities be. Yeah. And, and you, you, you know, and there are a lot of great companies out there uh, that work with that today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I work with a number of them, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and so they help you understand really in real, in, in near real time, mm -hmm. uh, and even in real time, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, if in, in fairness, if you can, mm -hmm. um, what those vulnerabilities are or are emerging. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then <laughs> you still haven't done enough. I mean, that's, you know, you've, you've right. done a lot there, by the way. That, that's a huge help to understand what you've got and, 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 and you know, be actively thinking on how you're going to, to, you know, to assess it and protect it, keep it up to date. That, that's going to cure a lot of ills, mm. right? Um, but then you have to also monitor, right, what's going on and look for anomalies. Right. Uh, and the example sometimes I've used, which is kind of a silly, stupid example, but, you know, it's great that you've put an alarm system on your house. Mm -hmm. And it's great you've put a camera on the front door. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bad guys used a ripsaw and came in through your siding right. in the back, yeah. right? And they're in the house. So, in other words, it's not enough. It, it, it's a huge help. Right. You have to do that, but you have to do more ultimately. Right. And that's, that's a real challenge for companies because monitoring and responding to things, it, it's time and money. Right. Right. So now it's it's a it's a risk management scenario, you know, and but you need to do as much of that as you can if you really want to maintain the integrity and reliability of your operations. So asset, right, mm -hmm. inventory and management actively, mm -hmm. <laughs> vulnerability mm -hmm. and threat right mm -hmm. management and then monitoring and responding and then to your example of the medical devices and the firmware mm -hmm. you know there are unfortunately real world examples of companies who um you know got that malware you know ransomware kind right. of threat uh, one of them <clears throat> you know i'll leave the names out right mm -hmm. you know said hey we've got backups we've been ready for this and they right. just wiped the systems and restored for backup, bringing with them the malware that had been there for right. six months. So, but still, um, if you think about that part of the process, that's something they could fix, and I'm sure they have. Right. So asset, right, mm -hmm. vulnerability, monitoring, and secure backup and restore. Mm -hmm. right. And if you're doing those four things, right. you're doing a lot. You're, you're, you're doing real cybersecurity and right. protection and response and, you know, of, your, of your systems. Yeah. yeah. In, in those things, one of the things that I've discovered over time is, I'm not saying any of them are easy, but it seems to be the, and where a lot of people put their emphasis, and it needs to be emphasized, but it can be a false sense of security, is that initial survey or, um, you know, I design, I, I've built, I built this house, I've got these amazing locks and I've got this great alarm system and that's hardy plank on my walls and I, you know, in our, in our home analogy. And I've got the CCTV and it's all tied back to my smartphone and so I've got this, you know, oop, and check everything's uh, working. And what doesn't happen over time or it's human nature is that not just in the steps that you laid out, but if you don't have a governance program, usually, hopefully, yeah. by a third party that's coming just to check, was your survey thorough? Yep. And they're not going to, they just have to sample it. They don't have to check everything. But if I check these 25 hard to check spots and they all check, then probably in the easy to check spots, it's okay too. And they just keep going down that line of, um, you know, how's your operational security? How is all of this working? And then they can they can test against your controls and then issue for your sake and for others' sake. The other thing that I love to see in that is, um, what's your process? And I'm thinking of in a data center world in particular, not just around security, but um, a data center is a lot like an airport. You build it. And you've got to operate this fully operational Death Star, right? Yeah. We are we are taking off and landing airplanes while we're also doing construction. <laughs> we're moving human beings. We're refueling. We're we're adjusting to weather threats and 
human threats and you know all of these other things <clears throat> and we have a product to deliver we have to do it in a certain way and to miss once is to have catastrophe you know there's no it's always got to be up it's always got to work and the way that um, organizations do that well obviously is excellence at every stage but the thing that ties it's the spackle that ties it all together is the is the governance that says um, one, what are you saying you're going to do? And we're going to we're going to validate its integrity that it's thorough enough. And then two, um, now that we have a now we know what you want to do. How are you doing it? And how do we validate that? What's your historical data? We also want to see how your you know what's your change process like? How do you how do you as things expire rotate them out without making things vulnerable? You know, back to your uh, CIO's walkabout where we've also seen people get in trouble is. There was no breach of the memory stick. That didn't happen. But when they decommissioned that system and took it out from within the mm -hmm. safety net, and now it's on a pallet out back, and everybody think it's sanitized, and it's not sanitized, um, that that can be, be pretty spectacular. Because I just took the treasure out from within the fortress and put it out back. When any row, and they do it, you know, it's kind of it's like dumpster diving for identity thieves. They just come by and mm -hmm. get some of this gear, yeah. and so you've got to have that whole program with chain of custody and whatever. The thing is, for me, um, Ed, that for in, even in my own personal world, when I was a network administrator, University of Texas, it there's a discipline. You really have to maintain discipline, and it's tough, right? It is tough. First of all, it's a lot of work. What controls do I turn on? What controls do I leave off? How do I get it? Because I can get inundated, and this is too many years ago to admit, um, uh, I was thinner with less gray, um, but, but decades ago, and what I remember when I would first turn on my different um, tools yeah. to alert me on what are my patch levels, what are the... What are, the, what are the threats to the, because there's always something probing on your network, whether you're connected to the internet or a LAN or a LAN or whatever, there's stuff crawling the wire that's probing. Um, and so you've got all of that going on and I want to be alerted, but even just anom anomaly only, it can get you know, pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And so manually to stay on top of that was pretty, pretty intensive. One of the roles that you have is automation. Do you do you think automation is playing a role now in helping to discern there's anomalies yeah, yeah, and then no. there's anomalies that we really need to? No, th this is very the very fair point. I mean, okay. and, and very important, right? Because again, it's it, it's daunting. It's only getting more complex, and and we're only sort of <clears throat> doing it more now than we used to years ago because we're realizing the risks and the dangers, and right. you know, it, it's not just reputational danger to companies right. you can put companies out of business you can right. keep, you know lose people lose jobs you know right. and, and, and so on you can also have loss of life right i mean it's it's, it's pretty serious right, right? but uh, so automation is important now remember i think i did make this joke to you at least offline about you know for siemens make it again right when we talk about you know automation you know people call me all the time saying like hey you know we've got this great robotic process automation capability and, you know you should <clears> take a look at it and and i'm like well Hey, um, when I talk about robots, I mean actual robots, right? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm in the OT world, right? Uh, and and I'm being a little bit, you know, above a wise guy, but still, the the point is that um, you know you do have some of those same concerns, and and so when I talk about automation, I'm in that OT right. realm, right? But that said, right, uh, automation is a huge, you know, time saver, force multiplier, you know, scaler, however you want to right. describe it. And, and so, you know, one of the things you mentioned was, you know, you were checking patches. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So automating patch management, that helps you a lot, right? Because, you, yeah. you know, how much more is in the data center today than it was when you're doing that admin right. job, right? I mean, it's just orders of magnitude right. of more things, right, right, that need to be updated, cared, and feeding, and the whole thing, right? Right. Um, very similar in the OT world, right? There's a lot there. So the ability to automate some of the functionality there for managing it is, is pretty important. Of course, you need to make sure you're doing that securely. Right. <laughs> right. So that's important as well. Um, but that said, it, it, it's, it's of huge importance. So, so, you know, like I said, usually when I'm talking about automation, it's in order to, you know, to accelerate a process to be able to do things faster, whether you're, you know, stripping paint off a part or you're right. you know, assembling things or whatever it is. 
but the same functions are happening, if you will, in the IT and networking world. You do need to have the benefit of automation, right? right? And it all has to be underpinned right. with cybersecurity, right? Yeah. So you know that that function is going to work the way you want, that that mm. medical device is going to read the way you need it to read and be accurate and certified and so on. And like I said, there is the benefit, you know, in, in you know, the various different industry segments. They're all sort of, you know, somewhere ahead behind, mm-hmm. depending, to, you know, compared to each other. And sometimes, by the way, surprisingly so, there's been a lot of movement in medical device safety, in mm. food safety, right, compared mm. to decades and decades ago. Sure. Right, um, and 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 other industries actually need to catch up sometimes on these sorts of things. But you know, aircraft provenance of parts, right? The bolt right. that you mentioned, yeah, you really need to know that it's going to be able to take the stress and load, right? And yeah. it wasn't a counterfeit, right? That will break under under <laughs> unfortunate circumstances, yeah. right? Um, so so there's different you know elements like that. Okay, um, in terms of security, but yes, you need to take advantage of the automation yeah. because otherwise it's just too much. Yeah, it's um, because we're making more and more complex systems and um, and the threats against the systems are becoming more and more elegant and more and more complex. Um, I was walking in uh, Walmart the other day and I, I, you know, they've got the big poles in front of the door so you can't just drive something through. Obviously important. Um, they and big rail, retail outlets all have these now. They they recognize that. They don't yeah. ring the building. They ring around these soft points. But I also remember listening to somebody saying, yes, of course we have those. If we took them down, um, <clears throat> we'd be inviting um, smash and grabs. But that is a one-one <laughs> infinitesimal risk compared to the other risks, either electronic risks or risks of people who walk right through those things and coming into whether it's uh, you know somebody harming other shoppers uh, in a live c- scenario or shoplifting or um, employees stealing from one another like just these other things. Mm-hmm. Um, but this was the initial big barrier. But we didn't stop there. You know we've got tools and systems that we use to help protect ourselves. So it was a very interesting. Um, perspective that I thought, so, hmm, should we just get rid of these things? No, you still need them. But um, while it's the most obvious, it's probably the least consequential protection they have for their facilities. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And, and, and you know, it, there's an overwhelming amount of data, I think you mentioned earlier, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you would get all these alerts and updates and so on. So having automation to sort of help you manage that is, is good. Um, and, you know, with the advent of, you know, AI and ML, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, you're, you're getting... ML meaning machine learning. Machine learning, yeah. yeah. You're, you're getting actual technology that can help you sort of do things and see things that weren't sort of sort of obvious to humans, right? right. The, the machine can go off and learn that. Now, there, there's a lot of progress to continue, that will continue to be made in that part of the industry, but yeah. it's already been, you know, helpful. I mean, being able to pull out correlations and data that, you know people just wouldn't see or it would take us too long to see, you know, it can also be helpful because that can also identify threats and help you manage things. But without talking about, you know, AI specifically, um, you know, the context of all this data is kind of incredibly important. And again, automation Mm -hmm. in the IT world or the OT world can help with these Mm -hmm. things. And, And that's been a lot of progress. Uh, a, a very pragmatic view of that um, on just the regular side of the business, if you will, is mm-hmm. that predictive maintenance is is sort of a real thing mm-hmm. now. I mean, people oh, yeah. talked about it. People thought other people might be doing it. Nobody was really doing much with it. Right. But but over the last decade, I mean, I've seen a lot of, of real implementations of predictive maintenance. And again, in the OT world, you might have, you know, a shaft vibration sensor and other things going on. You're saying, whoa, that's that's looking kind of odd. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're doing that, you know, algorithmically and at machine speed, you can pick up those kind of nuances pretty fast. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the same kind of approach can be used in, in the cyber world. You can have tools that are looking for things and mm-hmm. trying to help you see them. And then in a key point, you know, trying to react to them, mm-hmm. right? How do you, what do you do when you see something that's anomalous? Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 and it's tough, right? So in your, your network admin role, you'd sometimes run into scenarios where you're like, are we being attacked? Mm-hmm. Or something just failing? Well, right. a lot of the times, it's just something failing. Right. I mean, that's kind of the, 
the challenge with software, right? I mean, right. you know, without using any particular brands of software or types of software, right. I mean, I'm, I'm often heard to, you know, to quip right. <laughs> that, well, that's why we don't use that fill-in-the-blank right. software for air traffic control. Right. <laughs> right. right. Not good right. to have a problem in air traffic control. Right. right? Um, so, uh, you know, many problems that you would see in a factory environment or mm -hmm. other production environments, you know, may or may not actually be a cyber attack, mm -hmm. but they could be. Right. And, and sometimes they are. Right? Well, that's every sci-fi film ever, right? The first time you see the blips on your screen, you're like, who didn't click the screen or Chuck, go push the cable back. Like you, it's too, it's too remarkable to believe that that's, you know, there, there is an actual attack. The, the, you know, the barbarians really are at the gate, that it's something else, you know, um, <clears throat> whoever forgot to lock the something and then, and here they are overwhelming it. That's pretty much the human condition. We, we build all these controls for that eventuality. And when the eventuality hits, it's the uncommon person that immediately reacts according to plan or their tools or whatever. So uh, um, something that you said earlier that I got thinking about, but two, one is when I hear automation, I often link it directly to robotics. And I don't know why I do that. It seems like they're, they're really closely linked. But I'm also curious, other than the automation that we're talking about, like to respond to threats, just in terms of enabling... Uh, production, enabling, you know, what what are some of the things you're seeing that it's really cool in the world of automation, not necessarily tied to security, but just in helping human beings flourish that, that you've seen either that are going on now or in the near horizon, and you're like, well, that's pretty cool, or that's well, going to be helpful. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, automation and robotics, I mean, there's definitely a connection there, right? A lot a lot of things have become roboticized, right? Yeah. And, and uh, there's a term, even cobots, I don't know if you've heard that, uh -uh. you know, robots working alongside people, right? So hmm. the, the robot can do all the repetitive, right? you know, kind of, you know, grunt work, if you will. Right. Uh, the person can do a little bit more of the creative or precision work depending on the nature of what's being done in, in, right. in, in analyzing things, working with things. So to make a long story short, um, you know, robotics is a big part of modern automation, but it's not all of it. But there are a lot of things that are moving and doing, right, that mm -hmm. you could look at as being sort of roboticized. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, AGVs, automated guided vehicles or autonomous guided vehicles, right, mm -hmm. you know, these are, for example, taking a part out of storage. Maybe there's, uh, you know, you might have heard of a term of vertical storage or, you mm. know, automated storage and retrieval. I think that I think when I think of that, I think of um, the cool videos I've seen on like uh, material storage factories yeah, where they it's like a big cube, and the machines know how to go up and get to, you know, box seven four row A section C instantly mm, exactly no human right. has to c yeah. climb a scaffold they just go grab it and bring it back yeah that's exactly what i'm talking about okay. and it can be done in the library it can be done for parts bins right uh, for assemblies and and the whole point of it is right to bring the, you know to do efficient storage and to be able to retrieve things and so everything's tagged and right. scanned and so on uh, but you're bringing the right parts just to use that right. to the right place at the right time and the production capability. But it's right. programmable, so as your process changes, it can change as right. well, right? Or it can run multiple processes. Hmm. But then, you know, there may be places where you need to not have a part sort of, you know, be dropped in a bin for someone to get. You might want to have essentially a robotized vehicle hmm. come pick it up and bring it to where it needs to go. So mm -hmm. on factory floors, you do see little carts and trolleys rolling around, and these are, you know, commonly called... AGVs, right? okay, and so that uh, that extends your storage to bring it to you know where people are doing the work that they're doing, right? Hmm. right? The artisans that are working on the floor doing a lot of complex work and figuring how to repair something or how to build something, right? Um, you know, they they can then be fed the tools as well as the parts right. that they would need to do their jobs efficiently, right? And not have to spend time walking around looking for right. for parts, right? So you can you can pretty easily see the, the the sort of production optimization you get out of that, right? Yeah. And 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 you also, like I said, it's programmable. You also have the opportunity to say, well, now we're going to build a new product or do a new thing. And how do I leverage what I already have mm -hmm. 
you know, to support that new process, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and how you can extend it and so on. So hopefully that all yeah. that all makes sense. Yeah. It does, but you know what? Not but it does. When I try to have a conversation like this or entertain a conversation like this with people who, um, with people, let's just say people, a lot of times they get scared. What what I just heard was. Somebody's going to take my. There's not going to be a job for me in that e-commerce facility, or there's not going to be a job for me in this factory because I've been automated or robotized out of it. I, I think that's been a, re- a very real fear. I, I think what I'm, and I'm not an expert in, mm-hmm. in looking at the whole workforce situation, but what I'm seeing mm-hmm. just from my perspective mm-hmm. is we can't hire enough people. Right. We always have openings because now you're doing a. A, a more, I hate to say it this way, but you know, a more modern kind of manufacturing, right? And 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 you need those people, and the same people that worked with one set of tools could be trained to work with another set of tools, right? Um, and we just don't have enough. In fact, a lot of the, you know, sort of savvy manufacturing workforce is retiring, mm-hmm. right? And, right? And we need more people to come in. You know, everybody thinks about. Remember, we all heard, you know, in our era of going to school, become a knowledge worker, right? Right, we're going to be knowledge workers, and right. we're going to you know work with our brains, and we're going to work with technology, and sit at a desk. That's and, probably why I joined Airborne Infantry instead of becoming. A, <laughs> it took me a while to get to knowledge worker. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while being thrown out of airplanes and uh, aircraft, a rotary aircraft, before I feel like I should probably go be a knowledge jumping, worker. What is it? Jumping out of a perfectly good, good aircraft. airplane? Yeah, yeah, or thrown out, whatever, whatever you, <laughs> however pushed out. But yeah, so yes, we were all going to go be knowledge workers. Yeah. Well, we we need people that are you know advanced technology workers. Right. We, we can't in the and I'm talking just across the entire country. We can't hire enough. Right. I mean, there are always openings. Right? Yeah. Um, so you know the jobs are not always where the people are. There's always that kind of issues. And like I said, I'm far from being a workforce expert. Right. But, but I'm not seeing that that fear. Mm-hmm. You know, for that we all sort of thought, ooh, well, I'm, I'm, that, that could be a concern years ago. I'm not, I'm not seeing it now. Look again, mm-hmm. I'm not an expert. Right. I'm sure there's cases where people were displaced, but, yeah. but I certainly would like to think, especially because what I'm seeing on the other end is that we need more people and more people coming out of school, right, right, out of high school, out of college, to go into manufacturing, right. right. So we've heard the whole cry of we need more people in STEM, right, right. So I have several of my kids you know, girls and boys mm-hmm. are, are in scientific technology jobs. Right. So great. Right. right. Um, but none of them are in manufacturing. Mm. Right. Um, and, and, you know, at, at, at Siemens, who I work for, we, mm-hmm. know, we've had apprenticeship programs. We've had, you know, partnerships with different areas to do things because it's, it's sort of like we're going to, you know, this is a great place to build a factory and you mm-hmm. realize, well, and, and we need electricity and a road. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you, you might have to do a lot to make that a reality, right? right? And companies do that. But you also need the workforce. Right. Right. This reminds me of, um, I've talked about this before, I wrote an article on ag tech because mm-hmm. it's fascinating to me. The first premise is, we don't have more dirt. If you were to take an apple and cut it into force, eat three. The person who gave the analogy said, throw three away. Somebody my size doesn't throw apple slices away. So you eat three. And that sliver of skin on the fourth is the, um, the land available for farming. And yeah, we're desalinating places and we're doing some stuff, but it's essentially that amount of dirt. And... Uh, In some places, even on that strip, we have, uh, through ignorance, impacted the soil so that it needs time to be refreshed, if it can be refreshed, so that it can produce uh, food again. Anyway, so we've got to make more food for more people in a healthy way on approximately the same amount of dirt. So how do we do that? And complicating that is people aren't lining up to be farmers. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, kind of the opposite, right? And kind of the opposite. And so there's a, there was a myth that I believed in that uh, big, giant corporate farms are driving out, at least in the United States, the small farmers. Turns out, in my limited investigation, mm-hmm. not true. Um, that it's, um, there may be pockets of that, but, but overwhelmingly, 80-something percent of the food, whatever that looks like, whether that's milk or cheese or wheat or corn or whatever, or livestock, is from small farms, what they call small farms, 
um, as opposed to the big giant corporate farms. And so now when you've got, this is the scenario, um, talk about an environment, they need technology where they don't have broadband out to them in many cases, um, or it's difficult to get there, so you don't know 5G is rolling out anytime soon or, or fiber connection. And even if it did, their environment's constantly changing. Crops grow, you're out of doors, weather comes, uh, you've got dew in the morning and heat in the afternoon and snow and, and all of this, you know, it's not like providing connectivity for an office space. So that, uh, they have all of these complications and there's really cool tools that they can use. Um, and so the farming industry or the ag livestock industry is ripe for, if you're one of these experts and you want to live in a community that's, you know, the idea that they're trying to attract people is that this is a really healthy community and come, and come be part of this. This is as future tech as any other place. Come help us. And it's significant. So I thought that was a really cool story. But the other thing that it reminded me of was, as I see what John Deere's doing with their robotics um, in a weird way, it real, did you ever, when you were a kid, try to fall, fly an RC plane, sure. little radio control sure. plane? I did too. After I crashed and burned my third one, <laughs> I got tired of flying the trainers, quote unquote trainers. I was impatient. The, the controls were, um, this is my excuse anyway. I'm not looking at the people around me who mastered it, but it was, it was hard. It wasn't mm -hmm. easy. You can go out there with a modern drone, $800, $900 drone, um, that is exponentially more complicated than one of these things. Put the app on your tablet or on your phone, put it on a little harness in front of you, push a button, hover. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Do this, fly up there. Do you see um, Ed and I standing here in this field? Yep, I'm gonna click on Ed, follow Ed wherever Ed goes and maintain this, uh, re remember this position on the map and maintain this height, whatever. And you don't have to do all the RC planes. While it's exponentially more complicated, mm -hmm. it's conversely much, much, much simpler to fly. I, I'm, I'm being oversimplifying, but it genuinely now is. There's an example of automation right there. So now what you have is <clears throat> complex tools, but you can teach somebody pretty quickly to operate it, at least at a casual, simple level. And then to the degree that you can... Um, become boutique, really get good at it, um, you can go from a general operator, of which there's probably a job for something like that. Can I operate robotics in a certain situation? Because I'm directing, you know, the robots are going to do their robot thing, but I'm directing certain things as a human being. Um, we've seen this uh, back to ag tech where um, it's up to me to determine uh certain things and then tell the machines to go to go do their part and so it's this synergy that's this intersection it solves the growing problem the other thing that it did that we're looking at is or that they're trying to do is now i don't have to fly a crop duster over all of these fields i can spot fertilize um, i can spot um, weed and do these other things and my shrinking workforce that wasn't shrinking because of technology it was shrinking because people want stem or something else they don't want to be in the ag business they don't think i'm now supplementing it with these tools but it allows me to make boutique plants it's created this whole industry of you want a hand-grown hand-picked strawberries this person's going to make exponentially more money but even if it's in this other industry where that thing's picking tomatoes I've moved your, and this has been study after study after study has mm -hmm. demonstrated this. While some people have been displaced, most of those workers, and they need more, are f higher up the economic chain because they got a machine to pick the tomatoes. They don't need you to do that. They need you to do Q&A or sort things out or do more intricate, too expensive for a general robot or automation today things. You'll get paid more money. And oh, by the way, these things are generating so much more volume, mm -hmm. you need to handle it, but the price at the store has gone down. And I'm not saying that's the case in every scenario. I mean, we've been displacing human beings since there used to be somebody who had a business of carving out canoes with a hatchet. Well, we made lathes and other machines, and that person either had to learn how to use you know, the new tools to carve that out. That person's making TikTok videos. Today, <laughs> Whatever right? they're doing, right? <laughs> yeah. So funny, but I mean, Human beings have constantly had to adjust to innovate. We used to, we displaced all the wagon drivers who would drive their wagons down to Lake Erie to load them up with blocks of ice, to haul them back to the, to the ice warehouse, to be distributed by another group of people when refrigeration came along and all these other things. So we're constantly innovating. 
But it seems to me that in pretty much any case I can evaluate, that automation um, is enhancing human flourishing as opposed to... Um, well, I think it creates the opportunity for it, right? Yeah. And by the way, just to jump back for a sec, I mean, what a what a, an amazing thing to see over the last decades, right? Farmers, right? Yeah. These men and women. I mean, they have adopted far more technology to the Absolutely. points that you were raising that probably most people recognize. You know, GPS and and you know better machines. I mean, obviously they're being supported yeah. by by a lot of companies, but but. They're the ones who see what's needed there. You haven't lived till a pig farmer starts talking to you about LIDAR. (laughs) Straight-faced, knows how, (laughs) look, we've got the drones coming out here, we've got the machines, they're going to LIDAR the land, and so we're going to do this, and that way I can move my crops. Oh, by the way, yeah, we've got this set of wearables on our whatever, and it's trickle-feeding. What? what, what, Wearables? Wearables on what? On my livestock. I want to know... You know, on and on and on. P- people trying to go to free range chicken ranching from cage. They want to do it for a wide variety social reasons, economic reasons. Problem with chickens is they're stupid as heck. When they're in their little cage, it's unethical, is the allegation, and it, you know, all these other things, but they can't move, they can't hurt themselves. Chickens run in a particular pattern. So if you can put a wearable on them that tracks their pattern, It doesn't report anything. But the moment the chicken begins to behave Mm -hmm. with an anomaly and it tells you, now the humans come out onto the area and they're dealing with the anomalies in the chicken and they keep them from really harming themselves, from breaking a leg and whatever. I just sat there with my jaw in my lap like, this is a thing? It's a thing. And that's how they're using technology and information in automation. Now, when they can get the drone to fly over there and pick up the chicken, that's a story for another day, but pretty cool. Yeah, and so now, now we can come back to the factory, right? So you, you do want to monitor and you do want to look for anomalies. Right. And sometimes those anomalies, as we mentioned earlier, could be just something breaking. Mm. But sometimes it's under attack. Right. And, and then you have to have a then what? Yeah. Right? What do you do then? And so, so that's part of your cybersecurity process, right? right. Um, so there, there, there's a lot of, 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 of benefit from the automation, mm-hmm. and, and it's, really, it's really becoming a must, let's mm-hmm. face it. I mean, you know, ask any of those farmers, do, would you like us to pull back all the technology? Yeah. It just makes their life harder, right? right? Why would they want to It makes that? it impossible, really. Well, they, they seem to have found a way but, <laughs> in the past, but, yeah. but still, I mean, it's, it's clearly it's a lot of benefit, right? They, yeah. can, they can produce more, uh, they can yield more, Right, uh, they can uh, they can perhaps expand more, mm-hmm. uh, whatever makes sense to them. I mean, because I mean, let's face it, these folks are running a business, right? Right. I mean, right. in the ways that we typically really don't do, right? right? Yeah. CEO and everything else, right? Right. Um, but you know, all that said, so like you know, coming back to that that factory example, you need to you know have that whole holistic process, you know, that we talked about the four big steps of you mm-hmm. know assess and vulnerability and monitoring and restoring, mm-hmm. and, and 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 you know in there. There, there are plenty of companies mm. that, that, you know, I, I work with and, and we do, you know, some of this ourselves, you know, show people how they can have a then what, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, first you got to do the basics, but if you're doing the basics, which is great, then mm-hmm. it solves a lot of problems, right. reduces a lot of risk. Right. Um, and that's a, that's a key thing, right? I mean, company boards, uh, you know, government agencies and department heads, I mean, they need to be looking at it from a risk perspective, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, usually behind some breach, you're going to find that someone didn't think it was enough of a risk. Yeah. Now, look, plenty of times, you know, technology overwhelmed, right? There right. was some new attack, some vulnerability they didn't understand. Right. But if you're doing all the basics and managing your risk, you're, you're, you're going to be pretty far ahead of the yeah. game. But you do need to be able to then, you know, have your, your process take your people to do certain things, to lock things down. I mean, imagine that you had a report from your security guard in this facility that someone was trying to breach the gate. Right. I mean, there, there's a process behind what you would do. Right? <clears throat> Doors might lock. You know, things may change. Uh, you know, who knows what your process right. is, right? But I'm sure right. things will happen, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it has to happen in your data center. It has to happen in your factory, just like you would want it to happen in your home. You would like to know if someone was trying to come through your door right? yeah. or through your window or what have you. So hopefully that also makes sense. That it does. kind of ties it back <clears throat> together. It, when you sit down and you've got all of these tools, you're, 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 you're having a conversation with a, could be the federal government, it could be um, a, uh, you know, a 
civilian workforce or organization, how, and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting across the table, I'm like, golly, we've got um, all these things that we could talk about to, you know, I'm tr- usually or always, I'm trying to serve three constituencies. My customers, whoever they might be, it could be the American people, it could be um, uh, a community, whatever it is. I've got customers, I've got employees, mm-hmm. and I've got shareholders. To some degree, um, uh, I have those three constituencies. Mm-hmm. And we have been talking about everything from security, automation, um, uh, robotics, other tools like machine learning, artificial intelligence. Um, we could even get more granular and start saying things like uh, blockchain or whatever, which are just deeper, deeper, you know, um, uh, tools or, or ideas. How, where do you start when you when you want to sit down and help someone have that conversation without them feeling like, I, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't even know, like I'm paralyzed, I no, don't even know where I, to get going. I know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, this is the world we live in, right? right. And, and and so, you know, uh, you know, having once been an engineer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, doing that for a living, and, you know, we, we used to talk about things like this as a problem in N variables. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't solve those, right? Right. So, so how do you solve? I mean, mm-hmm. engineers solve problems, right? right? You know, other people solve problems, but engineers were typically there to right. figure something out or build something or break something or right. <laughs> maybe both. Uh, so, so you had to fix some of the variables, right? In other words, you had to make it a simpler problem mm-hmm. or set of problems that you could solve. Mm-hmm. So really, you know, another way of looking at that, and, you know, this is coming from the, you know, sort of marketing side of mm-hmm. my career, right? Mm-hmm. You, you can't take a single jump to nirvana. You're just mm-hmm. not, right. you're, you're not going to make it, right? It's right. either it's either too big a jump in terms of your, you know, what you need to do your organization or the cost, mm-hmm. right? And so on. And, you know, everything has to have an ROI, even for government. I mean, mm-hmm. government looks at it the same way. They right. want to have a business case analysis of why we're going to do something, right. why we're going to change something. And, and there's a hunger in companies and in government, too. People don't always think that with right. government. Government does want to be more efficient. Right. Trust me. There are people just like us, right? right. And, and so, um, you know, if you, can, if you can give them a path mm-hmm. that they can take where the steps that they can take each add value, mm-hmm. right? You know, there's an ROI mm-hmm. for, you know, of some form, right? You know, in better use of the people, less energy, less cost, less time, increasing capacity, mm-hmm. you know, throughput. Those are all meaningful terms to both companies and government. Mm-hmm. And and so um, if you if you can give them a, a path to nirvana mm-hmm. and steps that they can take that they get tangible returns on each step, now now you're talking. So sometimes it's as simple as, and I know this sounds too simple, but sometimes mm-hmm. it's as simple as saying. What's bothering you the most? Mm. I mean, it almost sounds like a silly question, right. but but sometimes the answers we get out of those kind of questions from, in this case, a government customer might mm-hmm. might be surprising. I remember in a communications situation that involved radios years ago, the customer said, it's the swearing. The swearing? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and he goes, it, it's the swearing. And when he described the scenario, what he meant was some people were going out of range on the system, maybe mm. being blocked by a canyon wall, whereas the system was still functioning overall. Right. So you could hear them swearing because they couldn't hear you, but right. you could hear them swearing right. at you <laughs> right. because really swearing at the system, right? Right. So, so that took some reengineering on how do we deal with that particular problem, which – you know, you, right. there's a solution there in basically what frequencies and also how you were applying the technology, right, to kind of give them better coverage, right? right. Less swearing. Right. That's okay. funny. Um, but another situation might be someone would say, like, well, we're having problems with parts. Mm-hmm. We're losing parts or, or parts are not where we need them. Mm. You know, okay, so okay, so now you kind of can drill into that because mm-hmm. fixing that problem could potentially, you know, you work on a strategy with them, but, mm-hmm. you know, it could be that first step you could take that gives them a real return. We solved that problem. We're now operating better. We're, you know, not wasting money. We're, you know, able to repurpose the money that we were needing to cover that with to fix other problems or, mm-hmm. you know, how, you know, taking advantage of the savings, right, mm-hmm. you know, and that sort of thing. So to make a long story short, sometimes it's that, it's that simple. It's just trying to say, well, what, 
what problems are you having that are affecting you operating efficiently and, and how could we help with those? Mm-hmm. One of the things that strikes me that <clears throat> one of the things that we're wrestling with here that we, we're constantly, and my CTO is doing an amazing job, is complexity of systems. Mm-hmm. So data centers in and of themselves aren't particularly complex, but we have a lot of complex components. And then that's just the data center proper. Then we house uh, organizations' environments and their environments are complex systems. And then when you go even micro down, it's kind of like discovering the DNA strand, that's complex. Then the code and the DNA strand, that's complex. And I'm sure that as we get Mm -hmm better tools or whatever to examine, you know, we, we keep finding degrees of complexity. And so a lot of our work is building the systems um, with security, with um, uh, automation uh, that help us to integrate those complex systems, do uh, gather the data, so that we can then structure the data, so that then we can do analytics, which leads us to, um, uh, once we get past analytics, we can get to automation. And then from automation, or in that realm, um, we have the ability to start looking at artificial intelligence. Mach- you know, I can, I can teach a machine, then have a machine teach another machine. Um, and we're pretty simple in the world of complex systems, relatively speaking, and I'm imagining um, there's a story, maybe it's because I uh, fly airplanes so much. There was a story of um, an airplane that had, I'm not going to go into all the details, um, but it crashed. It was a commercial jet off of the California coast. And upon investigation, what they determined was it had a robust preventative maintenance program. It came in for its scheduled routine maintenance. They performed the maintenance. Um, and then it crashed, uh, two flights, three flights later, just a few flights later, whatever it was. And upon investigation, what they discovered was there's a process and I don't remember the exact process, but they, they put bolts and bins. And when you go through the routine maintenance, Mm -hmm. you, you just, you just replace certain parts. Um, it's almost like getting an oil change. You don't inspect this filter to see whether it, we are keeping it or not. You just, you're replacing it. So they replaced the bolts, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, but it was whatever operated the uh, elevator, the rear elevator, I believe it is. And it was a person who did it, and the person reached into the correct bin, um, but the person who had placed the bolts in the bin, and these are millimeters of difference, teeny Uh tiny differences, had accidentally um, placed the bolts one bin short or one bin long Mm -hmm. or whatever. The person coming along, because they did this every day, many, many times a day, just muscle memory, grabbed the bolt from the right bin, inserted it in. Because they're so close, didn't really notice a lot of difference in resistance or whatever. It wasn't like trying to fit a metric into a standard or something like that. Got it in there. Well, it and did this for the however many bolts there were, three or four bolts. Well, as the flights were taking place, one failed, Mm -hmm. but kept flying. The second one failed, kept flying. But then a system designed for four with only two in it, when it was on some leg, they all failed, they lost control, the airplane crashed. And upon the investigation is where they discovered a number of things. A label, if I remember correctly, was incorrectly applied Mm -hmm. to the bag of bolts for the person who came along to stack the things to the person. And along the whole way, they all had check. Like when I take the, when I put the, before I put the bolt in the bin, I'm to hold it up to a physical thing. Like you can do at Home Depot. You could put the nut on their little bolts that they have there to make sure don't just take the bins word for it you can test it right there Mm -hmm. well they're supposed to do a test well they're in a hurry they didn't do the test and besides Mm -hmm. it's all labeled correctly on the bin and on the package and so they got it in well the next person that comes along when they take it out you're supposed to do the test just just in case and do the double check and they did that and then i want to say there was a third person once it's all installed that comes along behind them to check torque it down double check the whatever and this combination of misses, and I'm wondering if in the world of robotics or in the world of automation, where the machine can, 
with a precision that like it doesn't get impatient it just does its job Mm -hmm. and at a precision that human beings don't and after all i mean in their defense how many thousands of jets had they serviced without an issue it was a combination of people missing it which the crash investigators will usually tell you it's a chain of events it's exactly right because there's so many redundancies in a complex system like that which is why we all feel safe those of us who fly on airplanes. I'm way worried about the person who's coughing on me than I am my pilots, the operational integrity of this machine. It seems to me like there's an opportunity for automation and robotics to do mundane, highly accurate and precise checks, um, maybe with at the end a human being, hopefully doing their spot, their only job is to validate that final step. Yes, 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 or whatever it is. Do you, do you feel like, so that's a long story to say, do you feel like that's the future of robotics and automation? Or is it? Well, no, it, kind of, it kind of already is. Okay. All right. Now, look, when you're you know reaching into the guts of an aircraft and so on and so forth, there's still a lot of jobs that from a, you know, Cost and you know performance perspective. Human you know, beings people, are much more suited for it. Yeah. Highly trained people. Yeah. They know what they're doing. They can look in there and say, "Ooh, that looks odd." Right. Right. You know. Um, sure, there was a, a failure chain in this thing, which is mm-hmm. unfortunate. Right. Right. Uh, but um, uh, you know, that hopefully was fixed. Right. Yeah. Um, but but yes, but in a lot of cases, you're already seeing uh, uh, automation used, and it's been for quite a long time. By the mm-hmm. way, it, it's 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 increasing, but it's already being done for a lot of those things Uh, because that way you have those that repetitive grunt work can be done by the machine Mm. right and then when the new product comes along then the people can think about okay how do we how do we adapt to that Mm. you know change in the product or some other you know activity and by the way things like the tools we talked about last time digital twin Mm -hmm. are are immensely helpful in that planning process because you can kind of play around with it in the in the digital world Mm. right and then see where to apply robotics and other Mm -hmm. technologies hardware and software that can help you you know in a in an optimized process right Mm -hmm. and maybe more importantly too that for the future like I said, when things change, mm-hmm. you can use those tools to help you optimize the changes, whether those changes are temporary mm-hmm. or, or, or permanent, right? Mm-hmm. We're expanding, we're adding more product lines, or you know, we're, we're having a problem. We're going to have to pick up something because we lost another factory or there was a storm and they, people had to evacuate and we mm-hmm. shut it down or it got flooded or you know, what, mm-hmm. what have you, right? So the ability to deal with both sort of planned change and unplanned mm. change is uh, is is kind of helpful right? yeah. you know, with those with those tool sets but yes i mean so so you know in your scenario it would be very helpful to have things that require precision and accuracy be done by machines mm-hmm. and have sort of the creative knowledge work right <laughs> be done by people right yeah. and 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 sometimes there are tools that can help with that too uh, you know how that all evolves over the coming decades you know, right. remains to be seen. How fast those sorts of things happen, but but right now, you know, they're, like I said, we coming full circle to the workforce example. We just don't have enough people coming yeah. into those things. There's there's a facility in in the Chicago area called the MXD. Mm, never heard of it. And and this is a manufacturing playground where okay. companies like mine and others, you know, put equipment there and they run different scenarios and people can play with advanced manufacturing, just the kind of thing you're talking about. What if that company, mm-hmm. that maintenance and repair operation said, hey, um, you know, I'd rather have my, you know, skilled technicians doing, you know, things that require more adaptability. These are some things I'd like to automate to see if I could kind of lower the cost and keep the precision and so on and so forth. You know, so they're either going to do that experimentation themselves, or they're mm. going to work with a facility mm. like this, right? And and so it's a wonderful uh, facility. We sometimes bring customers there. They do demonstrations. They get involved in in research work. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of it's government funded. You know, this is where you see if you've ever heard of America Makes. So this is a whole initiative that's funded by the federal government to mm. advance manufacturing, right? So there's a lot of interesting things going on there. But this gives people the ability to you know to kind of play around with these things and see how you would optimize right and you just come into the facility you got to have some credentials or how do you well yeah i mean you could approach that facility and talk to them about i have this kind of 
thing I'd like to, to, to work on, you know, what right. do you have, uh, you know, I could provide some funding for that, okay. or is there anything going on with the government where we could get, you know, co-funded, right? right? Uh, and, and there are calls for, you know, these things periodically from the government to fund different initiatives, right. by the way, in robotics, in advanced manufacturing, right. and so on. So there's a tremendous playground there, right, mm. um, for, for people to come to. Uh, and there are a number of other similar um, you know, uh, um, you know, facilities and, mm-hmm. and institutes, if you will, that are mm-hmm. that are you know a combination of company and government funding to advance things in robotics, in materials, right? Mm-hmm. The material sciences, right? The different types of materials you use to make things. How could you do make it, you know, stronger, lighter, right? More resistant to you know corrosion, what have you, right? Right. Yeah. When do you think we're going to see? So far, we've talked about robotics primarily in manufacturing. Yeah on the farm. We haven't talked about RoboCop. We haven't talked about a robot in a school room. Um, How about in a hospital? Or in a hospital, you know. um, One of our, one of my um, peers in the data center world um, has a, um, it's a cool idea, I actually like it. Some of my friends were poo-pooing it, but I really Mm -hmm. like the idea. They have a, they have a robot that goes up and down out on their data center floor that, can check for temperature for COVID, can, you know, for, for the people in the facility that has CCTV, that it's got, it's got a number of functions, pretty, pretty simple, pretty direct, still, I think it's a pretty cool idea. But I wonder how we would react if I'm over here at the town square, um, at, you know, at Reston or Dulles or whatever, and I see a, a robot of some sort performing just changing out the garbage cans, you know, the trash from the garbage cans. And, you know, it's got a routine, it follows it, does its thing, and then and then leaves the area or whatever, or sweeps the streets or whatever. I don't think people, will, if they went into a factory or a data center or a, uh, whatever, and they saw some of these routine tasks, we'd be like, oh, that's really cool. But if we saw it on the street, I think we might get a different reaction. Um, how soon do you think we're going to have something on the street doing something like that? Like in our regular civilian lives, not out in a no, sure, job no, workplace. Fair, fair, fair question. I mean, I, I think you literally could do that today. In fact, it's really sort of already done in some cases. Right? Really? Uh, but this is more of a regulatory safety kind of thing. Mm. I mean, you know, you hear Tesla talking about robo taxis, right? I mean, yeah. They don't always use those words, but yeah. you know, those sorts of things are coming. It's 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 less of a technology issue than it is a, a like a social acceptance kind well, of well regulatory and safety really mm. is kind of the i think the main sort of thing there because uh, like i said you, you know look um would you agree that it's possible that a cargo aircraft could literally depart from its being loaded you know follow the uh, instructions from air traffic control ground control and take off and fly across the country and land at another airport and taxi up to a, you know, an offloading facility. You think that could be done with no human intervention Absolutely. Today? Okay. So that's not trivial, right? right? Um, but do we, are we ready for that? So there's a social aspect, like mm-hmm. you said, and there's also a regulatory aspect, right? Because mm-hmm. that's sort of behind that, right? Mm-hmm. There's, 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 a, <laughs> there's a lot behind both of those statements that, yeah. you know, probably would take right. you know, way too much time to go into, right? But the technology is really kind of there. The, mm. the, the ability to have, you know, vision sensing, mm-hmm. uh, looking at, well, there's the garbage can. Mm-hmm. I'm going to need to sort of move a little bit because it's not lined up quite right. Okay, there are the mounting points. I'm going to lift it up you know, like one of those big dumpsters. Right. Right? I'm going to, you know, empty it into the truck. Right. Uh, I'm going to you know, put it back down in the right place, and then I'm going to move on. Now, look, there's a lot even in there. You know, right. what if it gets stuck? What if something didn't come out? You right. know, do you really know if it worked? You know, again, sensors. Right. Right. And so there's a lot that can be done today, uh, and there's a lot that we're looking at doing, like, you know, having robots do real grunt work. Right. You know, right. A- ablating paint. Right. Off the side of a ship or a, a, a ballast tank. Or these are things that are actually conceivable mm. to do, right, because of the right kinds of sensors mm-hmm. and technology 
right? They can can see if you know what needs to be done and, and to do it right. There's a number of companies there. Look, I'm not saying people are doing it all over the place right. today, but but there's a lot being done there that eventually it will be more commonplace. But to have things sort of out on the street, yeah, or to have things that literally in, in, could impact public safety, yeah, I, I see. You know. The, the regulations, the laws, uh, as well as the society have to kind of catch right. up with that a little bit. It wouldn't, to your point about the paint stripping off of a ship, I'd be like, it would fascinate me if I saw that. Like, oh, that's really cool. Maybe even if I saw them climbing towers and cleaning windows, scrubbing buildings. That's pretty cool. I don't know that there's any more risk to a robot falling than a human being in the scaffolding falling right there's already there's a risk of failure um uh so for whatever reason in my psyche that doesn't seem like oh that would that would be weird um the idea i mean drones are flying my uh, nephew was a, a drone pilot in uh, the army and you know they sit in a trailer while the drones flying in the u.s or around the world do whether it's at least training missions or whatever so these things are happening already um, and probably a lot we don't even know about. So so th- some of that happens already, although you reminded me of, I had, um, I had a friend on, or, or a friend who is with um, building out part of the electrical infrastructure for electric cars. Mm-hmm. And I happened to mention casually, I didn't even think about it, uh, one of my good friends had gone to Nashville, bought a Tesla, but through the circumstances, didn't get there till like one in the morning, had to be back in Atlanta, four hour drive in four or five hours. He was running on empty, put it on autopilot. He's still in the driver's seat, but just kind of dozed off and on while it was driving. I was like, that's pretty cool, autonomous driving. And the, my other friend was like, that's horrifying. There's too many examples. Well, by the of, way, the Tesla will nag at you and pull pull over if you're <laughs> you, if you're not operating, right. right? You still have to monitor, right? Um, yeah said, uh, the idea of this thing, we're not ready for that. That systems, Tesla will tell you, to your point, you're not ready for that. Um, so I don't know if he was exaggerating in his napping. It seems sincere, but he was like, yeah, man, I was, I was dozing during part of that, uh, uh, that drive. Um, it, it just, I don't know, the idea of um, dev- autom- robotics operating in a civilian world, greeting the door, you know, accepting the packages and bringing them in. And, you know, could you have something that could go out, take the packages off the front porch, carefully bring them back in and put them somewhere so nobody stealing your packages off of your, like in this so many ways, it seems, you know, I got a Roomba, which really is just a uh, Maine Coon cat transportation vehicle. <laughs> I've learned doesn't no, that's not good. picking on that's them, good. but it that's pretty good. much just pushes the dirt around. But to my cat, that's its autonomous vehicle. Dink, dink, it rides all over the place. Um, I don't know that that's a robot. Certainly not in the. But it's it's this sort of image. It's an illusion. No, of but one. let's come back to your your road example. So yeah. I mean, I don't know if your current car, SUV, whatever, yeah. has automatic emergency no. braking. Um, it might, it's got, um, yeah, I mean, if, if I hit the brakes, it's got, uh, ABS. Okay. But you know, uh, have you, have you, if this is a familiar term, so, so, yeah. you, you know, there, there's a, a radar maybe. Okay. And if it sees you're approaching something too rapidly, right, it's like a lane assist kind of it's thing, it's going to, yeah. it's going to break for you. Yeah. Right. So, so that's a kind of system. This is the beneficial side, right? right? Like you might not be able to react fast enough. So I was in a car once and it, we're all on the highway, and everybody hit the brakes. Right. Okay. And as I went to stop on the brakes, hoping that no one right. was going to run into me in the back, right, right the car was already braking. Mm. Right. So there's the benefit of the automation. Right. right? I mean, right. it was reacting faster to that change in acceleration and that closing space faster than I could. Right. Right. The radar, the processing, right, mm-hmm. hitting the brake system kind of a good thing right right i mean you know that case i stopped just fine but you know what if i had leaned over for a moment right right and 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 really was not reacting fast enough right that 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 could be a lifesaver right Right. so so that's the positive side of this Mm -hmm. but then having you know cars vehicles trucks operating completely autonomously you know look when it's when it's when it's Mm -hmm. uh you know locomotive pulling rail cars and you know 
you know, you're expecting the train crossings to work safely and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's it's sort of its own road. Right. But when you're on the road mixed with everybody else, the general population, then yeah. you kind of want to make sure it's pretty safe, right? Yeah. And so, so there's the society and also the, you know, sort of regulations because the the people that are providing those vehicles, mm-hmm. whether they're trucks, cars, or, you know, mm-hmm. delivering your pizza, mm-hmm. right? They, they, they want to know mm-hmm. what the rules are mm-hmm. so they can build to that, mm-hmm. right? So, so we're, we still have a little ways to go in that mm-hmm. perspective, but the technology mm. is, is pretty much there in yeah. many cases. I mean, you can always talk about edge cases and different scenarios and, and right. so on. And, you know, but, you know, you can also figure out what to do in those cases, which is sometimes it pulls over and radios home. Yeah. Right. I yeah. got a problem. Right? Yeah. I think we're going to see it. Um, I don't know. It could be, I mean, it's the future. So we'll just take a guess. When I was a kid, if you were 14 years old, you could get a driver's license before the 16 year old. If you were on a farm mm-hmm. operating a vehicle, a farm vehicle by yourself, even if you're going farm to market. So there were certain circumstances, unimproved roads or whatever. So there were restrictions, but you could do that. Um, <clears throat> you couldn't go into town. You couldn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. There were all these rules. But in this circumstance, you could do that. It wouldn't surprise me if with that same logic, robots, fully autonomous, have the ability, whether operating vehicles or uh, back to your kind of your cargo plane analogy, I'm running from the farm into the feed store. I follow these, you know, they the community makes these dirt roads or backtracks or they're farm to market road only or whatever it is, and they're fully autonomous and they follow the thing. Is it possible that they could go sideways and break, you know, whatever and end up someplace they shouldn't and be dangerous? Yes, but so could that 14 year old in that tractor or in that truck or whatever. The other is, um, To me, the most common place I run into 5G is stadiums, sporting events, uh, venues where you can bring your device together to enhance your experience. Mm -hmm. And and similar to that, I'm seeing, at least in the Atlanta area, these really interesting little communities where they're sort of an all-enclosed community of, uh, you know, work, live, play. Um, you've got several restaurants, you've got movie theater. Uh, my kids are trying to remember what that was like. You've got, uh, you know, a, a little amphitheater for just, you know, whatever your little music venue is or whatever. Like it's literally this cool little enclosed thing. The idea is you just bike around it. They're decent size. I could see communities in the future that says, look, we embrace, you sign up to agree, but we embrace technology and robotics in a certain way that perhaps there is a, uh, I don't want to say a robotics nurse, but an elderly care facility you're wearing, um, not a nursing home, but just people over a certain age that are in pretty good health that have wearables and they want a certain amount of independence. But I have, um, you know, I not only have the CCTV and the IOT sensors or whatever, but I have robots or devices that could be first responders that can or could be delivery pick up your mail at the central depot bring it to your house drop it off they follow the prescribed paths or whatever things like that in these very specific well-defined everybody agrees to it yeah ways. because you're simplifying the problem aren't yeah. you? yeah yeah and, and that and that makes it solvable for yeah. certain certain cases right and i i agree i absolutely agree yeah i uh before we wrap up here what um, one, what haven't we talked about that we should have talked about? But two, I'm really curious, what about robotics? Because um, I don't get a chance to talk to a lot of people that are familiar with this. Do you think that's going to be really, besides efficiency and um, kind of the ways that we've talked about it now, is there anything that, wow, wait till you see this, this idea when it materializes or this idea when it becomes safer is really going to revolutionize, I don't know, human, the human experience in work, human experience in play. Uh, they're really cool. So, for example, um, when you and I talked a long time ago, it might have even been on the first show, we talked about, I think it's the Boston Dynamics uh, robot. Mm-hmm. And I had to go back and rewatch the video, and I was blown away by, because I've seen robots being used in ranching, but it wasn't these types that could flip, run, stand up, you know, all this really cool stuff. I don't know what we would apply that to, but it was really interesting to me. If you think about robotics a decade from now, what do you think they're going to be doing that we're not really 
talking about yet. Well, I mean, I can't talk about all the R&D. Yeah, 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 no, 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 no. I don't want to, no state secrets, just. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But 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 I'll, I'll, I'll bring up one thing. Um, you know, one thing the Navy was looking at years ago, and I have no idea where this is now, is they yeah. were wondering if they could use something like that robot to go into a dangerous environment. In yeah. other words, a, a shipboard fire. I mean, that's yeah. a really bad scenario for a ship. Yeah. Uh, and you need to react quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so you're asking sailors, you know, to don yeah. gear and rush into danger. What if you could send the robots first to do certain things that they could detect and react to and also maybe have some, you know, yeah. semi-autonomous control uh, for things that people could see behind them. Right. And yeah. and, and, th- and then when things were in better shape, you could actually have the, the fire, sure. fire crew come in and. And take care of the rest. So, so I, I think you're going to see it extending, mm. right? That's something that you're going to see more of. And again, you have a very similar thing to what we talked about with the cars on the road, mm. right? Um, you know, having RoboCop, you know, strolling down the road versus yes. having some, you know, <clears throat> scaling of, of of you know, capability and power and force production or whatever right. the scenario is coming along that that's a slightly different scenario when that 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 being autonomous has a lot of people actually kind of frankly frightened right, right? yeah oh absolutely because yeah, yeah. The, there, therefore by the way since we're human right so therefore since it's frightening somebody's working on it right <laughs> right and and somebody's also working about how to defend against it right uh, but a similar case that we see with with drones yeah. people are manually operating drones but there's also some semi-autonomous operation and there's even some fully autonomous right. operation. And that, also not new, but it's an extension of, of capability. So right. hopefully that sort of made general yeah, sense, right? You, you actually, uh, you, I'd be curious. Um, so for example, yeah, I wouldn't want to see a RoboCop anytime soon. Uh, I don't know that we figured out how to do that perfectly as humans. Mm-hmm. Do I really want to teach a machine? And I, and I love law enforcement. I'm a big pro law enforcement, but we still miss it too often, right? Even even in spite of all of our best efforts. So would I really want a machine? Probably not. But what about uh, fire rescue? What if there's a team that runs into a building that can accelerate up store uh, stairwells that um, while they're costly and valuable, it's not human life and they can, they're quick responder to put things out. They don't have to worry about a gas environment. They can, um, I'm almost thinking of like a, a superheroes. They can run up and they, you know, extend hydraulics to, you know, stabilize a platform or a facility or something while we and do, uh, you know, do a scan to see, are there people here? What's going on? Yeah, yeah. And and in fact, sort of coming back to your Tesla example, since you brought that up earlier, yeah. you know, I've driven a Tesla with autopilot on. Yeah, right? remarkable So what does that vehicles. mean? Well, it, and it is remarkable. But think about it. I'm looking out the front windshield. I'm scanning around through the mirrors, kind of like you do, right? You're right. kind of scanning around. But when autopilot's on, I'm monitoring it operating the vehicle. I'm still watching. I'm still paying attention. But it's a lot less tiring. Right. I mean, that, that's what I notice after I'm done with a trip. Right. All those micro movements that you'd make and all those things you did to operate right. the vehicle safely, even with cruise control, by right. the way, um, it's just less work. And I also have the benefit of it's looking around me essentially in 360 right. all the time. Right. So as I'm, so oh, that truck's slowing down, it's watching over here while I'm watching there. Right. So that's, that's kind of helpful. And in now in your, you know, in your fire safety example there, yeah. those robots can, you know, again, <clears throat> be, you know, part of the first response and, and try to make things safer for people they're trying to rescue as well as for the firefighters coming behind them. But they can also be looking at other things like, you know, let's go stabilize the roof in this room or the, you know, the ceiling in this room while we then get the people out and, you know, right. and so on. Right. So, so yeah. there, there's, there's, there's an extension of capability, mm. right, that, that can be possible. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'm an optimist. I, I, I think it's, um, there's way more up than bad. Um, there's always risk. But I just think it's human nature. You know, one day somebody was standing on a shore and instead of just canoeing up and down rivers, they said, you know, we should go that way, even though we don't see land. Absolutely. Let's just go. I couldn't couldn't agree more. Let's go try it. So yeah. what haven't we talked about that we should have talked about today? Well, there's just so much. I mean, when you talk about digitalization and automation, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it is the future. Yeah. And there's, you know, we didn't talk about, for example, power and energy. Mm. There's a whole world there 
Uh, our, Do you have a couple mind. minutes to tease that out? I don't. I know we're, we're. Let me take a look at the clock. But I'm curious. We got a few minutes. I think. Yeah, we got a few minutes. When you think power, energy, and automation, because that's near and dear to my heart. I've had. We just had uh, Professor Don Sadaway from MIT, who has mm-hmm. um, invented the liquid metal battery, so they can bring mm. very inexpensive energy storage to the grid. I mean, one of his big ideas as angel investor was Bill Gates. Uh, this is a remarkable ten-year-old company now because uh, he's a big fan of battery innovation with theme ion and others, but in order to do grid level storage, you've got to have cheap, safe, um, highly capable storage. And he's one of a number of technologies. So he was really fun to have on there. We've had uh, Professor uh, Dan Kamen, who's part of the energy, he runs an energy storage lab out of Berkeley, Mm -hmm. um, the lab out of Berkeley. And so it's a conversation for everybody, whether it's you know renewable or safe nuke or storage or efficiencies. How is uh, digitalization and automation playing into that? Well, it, it is playing into it. And, and it's also not even at the grid level. I mean, there's a lot going on at the grid level. Right. And also, by the way, a lot of cybersecurity stuff going yeah, on at the grid yeah. level. <laughs> and there, but there's also stuff going you know, on the sort of distributed energy level, even back to you know, our own houses and dwellings, right? right. Uh, the ability, for example, you know, the, you know, I'm in an area that has a very good, you know, um, uh, power provider, mm-hmm. uh, electric company, mm-hmm. and and uh, I've only ever had one outage. Mm-hmm. But when it happened, it was for over 12 hours, mm-hmm. and I had happened to, to buy some backup batteries. Mm-hmm. They actually got to big enough storage where I could run. The freezers, mm, yeah, right. So lots of kids, lots yeah, of eating, right. Frozen food, helpful, right. Um, a lot of money in the freezer, right. <laughs> right? Yes, that's a kind that of storage well. there, right. And and it was nice to be able to say, <clears throat> wow. Um, fortunately, I have the battery now. You could also use a backup generator, right. which is gas. But right. the question is, okay, so what happens when you run out of gas? You're trying to get more right. gas. That can be a challenge without right. getting into that whole right. morass. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I had solar panels, right? Right. But didn't have to use them. Fortunately, the power came back on. But it was nice to be able to go to sleep knowing that all the freezers were just yeah. happy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Running off the batteries. Yeah. The um, One of the things that uh, Professor Satter was talking about there, um, one of the products they're working on right now is it's about the size of a refrigerator. It's consumer product. It's 10 days of a little bit more, I forget what he said, the average American family, what their kilowatt hours per day is. I, I would say a number, but I know it's wrong. But let's just say it's 10. I don't know what it is, but he, he said it. We'll publish this podcast here in a few weeks. Um, but uh, he said this thing will be about refrigerator size. It's not going to blow up. It's not going to catch on fire. There's no, It's just dirt. It's just chemical reaction and even in a breach it's spectacularly safe because of the the way that it's um built chemistry is amazing and yet it will run out so we just had a power outage just before i came here i do happen to have a backup generator and because it happens enough where we live in georgia we have these big 40 60 foot Mm -hmm. white pines beautiful to look at terrible for your yard and whenever a storm comes falls on power lines and they're pretty good at restoring it but uh, we keep um, some fuel in the house and we have a standby generator. So I, with my hundreds of dollars of uh, food in my garage freezer, and we have an outdoor refrigerator freezer, uh, quickly running the lines, getting that running, and keeping an eye on the fuel. Um, I would love to have that storage device that is trickle fed off of my grid for now. We don't really, because of our circumstance, have a spot to put solar, but that will change at some point in the future, I'm sure. But even if I'm trickle feeding that device off of the grid, and now I've got a week worth of standby, and if my community has something like that. Yeah, so that's a power density thing. Once the power density gets high enough, mm. then you can deliver that kind of you know long-term you know, energy storage, right? Yeah. So you can feed that power back into your system. Now now it's very practical because, you know, today typically when people would have like a natural gas or propane operated right. generator or a gas generator right. where you're going right. to have to have, you know, fuel stabilized, yeah. ready to go. And yeah. people do this in hurricane regions, right, right too. 
but but kind of nice to not sort of have to worry about any right. of that, right? That, right. that the, the grid or your solar panels or whatever are feeding that right. storage device, and people can also use that to you know to basically run off their own power, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, during peak times, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we're probably in your area, like mine here in Virginia, where we have pretty good electric rates on, yeah. a, on a national basis. Yeah. But some other areas, it's a little more problematic. And if you can do what's called peak shaving, right? Yeah. Um, kind of nice, right? Yeah. You can you can kind of save yourself a lot of money. Those things end up, therefore, paying for themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, which is kind of nice, yeah. I just like that the world, one of the things that seems really interesting to me is the world's having these conversations. I, it's, 10 years ago, if we had talked about um, sustainable energy in a lot of my personal community, a number of the people in that community would have gotten into an argument about how much human beings are actually causing climate change or whatever, which seems like a pretty foolish conversation, but it's a conversation nonetheless. Ed, almost without exception, those same folks are looking at how do they get solar, and it's not so much because they've changed their mind about their tailpipe or their impact. Um, And I don't have, I don't spend a lot of time trying to persuade them about that anymore. They're on board because they want energy independence. The idea of um, the grid is my failover. I can be to some degree, if not completely independent. And they're also now on the electric vehicle bandwagon. Uh, we probably 45 to 50 percent of the gas stations in our area were out of gas for a few days when the pipeline debacle. Mm-hmm. And so th- who wasn't? The Chevy Volts, the Teslas, the other electric vehicles driving around. And we have such low electric rates mm-hmm. that if I'm recharging overnight and most of us, one of the reasons why people the cost of the vehicle, but really it's also range. Mm-hmm anxiety, you know, how far, but a engineering friend of mine that works with me, he has a little Chevy Volt, mm-hmm. an older one. Um, he loves it. He goes, I never, any, you know, exceed the range of the, it's a hybrid. He said, I never exceed the range of this. And I commute through Atlanta and it's recharged every day. When I go out there in the morning, I don't, I go to the gas station once every six weeks or something to fill up this little tank. And so many of us now have changed our perspective and our mind on, wow, I'm fully electrified. And um, I don't need a gas station up the street. I don't have to make that trip. I don't need it near my aquifer. I don't need this storage here in my house. When I come out in the morning, I can just recharge, or or, I'm charged and ready to go in 99% of the instances. No, absolutely. I mean, it changes the paradigm, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're charging mostly at home. You're charging sometimes at work or other destinations. And then, you know, there's there's high-speed, you know, DC charging, right. you know, high-voltage, high-power. Yeah. When you get out on the road, there, you know, and, that's, and that part is growing. I mean, Tesla kind of pioneered that, if you will. Yeah. But, you know, there are lots of players there now. But, you know, I you know, will be going, you know, to a, a family event. Um, in in a couple weeks, and mm-hmm. I'll just hop from supercharger to supercharger. Oh, do you have a fully electrified vehicle now? Yeah. yeah. Wow, show off! It's kind of a vulgar well, display of power. You know, it, it, it's kind of it's kind of fun for me because I'm a car guy because it's, yeah. it's it's very fun to drive. It's you know it's you know autopilot's like not today. I'm driving. Right. <laughs> well, I love them. The the thing that um, so I, one of my buddies were just at his fiftieth birthday and um, uh, his gift was a. Tesla. None of us knew his wife. This was a long time reward, delayed reward. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, it'll be here in end of July, mm-hmm. supposedly. We'll see. But um, uh, we have we have ridden in them, and I didn't even realize it's like a slot car. Like it is. Besides the technology, which is very very cool. And I always used to think, you cannot replace the sensation of my 68 Camaro or that Firebird or, oh yeah, you can. I wouldn't say replace it, but it is the same, what just happened. Yeah. (laughs) Enticing. (laughs) And especially as I'm cruising through my 50s, I'm less interested in how fast I get to the next spot, just how comfortable I am. How elegant is this thing? How quiet is it? It is an amazing, whether it's Tesla or any of the other new ones, and where they for sure had me, my wife started laughing at me, was the promise of the electric truck. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. because I, I have a truck now. I have to drive it as a daily driver. It wasn't supposed to be, but I have an 18, 20, and 22-year-old daughters. So all the other vehicles are mm-hmm. accounted for. Um, and I love, when I need my truck, I love it. It's um, indispensable, and I we need it regularly just because of the outdoor activities and stuff that we do. But the idea of that, an electric truck with that kind of torque the power that it has, but it, I don't need a great big range. We do stuff within 45 minutes to an hour of the house. That just seems like, and if I can be autonomous more or less in my home when I'm generating my own power, that seems amazing to me. Yeah, now that puts a whole nother level of stress and complexity on the grid, by the way. So that, that like I said, that could be a topic for another day. But yes, that's exactly kind of what I was talking about in terms of being able to have locally generated power your own power, your own microgrid, yeah. uh, and be able to sustain yourself through, you know, various storms or what have you. It's it's kind of nice. And, and also, you know, like I said, these systems have evolved enough over the years that, you know, advanced enough over the years where, you know, you can, you can calculate the payoffs mm-hmm. for solar or other forms of energy. People have, you know, geothermal heat, right? This is not new technology right. per se, but they've continued to advance all those capabilities and improve them. So, right. yeah, there's a lot there. A lot there. I see what they're doing in Iceland with uh, geothermal heat. It is uh, um, it's pretty amazing how they whole communities are heated by uh, what's in the rocks, what they have in there. We don't have that in Atlanta. We have limestone. We have pine but trees. But in the northwest part of the U.S., m- a lot of the power, maybe in some places, the majority of power is mm. is uh, hydro. That's true. That's you know, true. It's, and it's, that's been going on for a long, <clears throat> long time. So, yeah. I mean, so we've been doing, quote unquote, renewable power yeah. for a long time. Right. One of the things that w- seems to me that would be really interesting, Professor Sadaway also mentioned this would be a great, uh, it's a great problem, not for his generation, but w- within the next 40 years, which is to um, be able to transmit power from a hydro source or uh, Quebec or whatever, uh, the Midwest, near frictionless to other parts of the continent. Well, that, that now you've touched on a huge, huge area. So mm. transmission, right. right? Transmission and distribution, but but in particular transmission, long haul. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's one project that I'm just keeping an eye on with a couple of colleagues. I'm mm-hmm. not actively involved with it. I was mm-hmm. involved in, in th- activities with it early on. It's a transmission mm-hmm. thing. I'll just leave the right, name sure. out. Right. But ten years. Really, ten years because you're you're doing studies and you're doing ROI and you're doing environmentals and you're having hearings and you're then getting feedback and you're modifying and it just goes on and on and on. So, so being able to generate power is not the issue. Right. Being able to, to to bring the power to where it's useful yeah. that is a huge, huge issue. Yeah. yeah, that's what he was really excited about. Was we have places here and in other parts of the world. And the first goal is to be able to deliver it within a continent, you know, intercontinental or within a country's boundaries, near frictionless. But when we can extend that to, for example, across all of North America or down into Mexico or South America or whatever, and then globally, those are the big ideas that Mm -hmm. really have captured his imagination. He said that will be as big as anything, a game changer for human flourishing. So sounds like that's a pretty good spot for us to end this conversation anyway. You bet. All right, Mm -hmm. Ed, thank you for coming in to the QTS experience. It's, um, we've had you on now twice. (laughs) I can't wait to the next time and um, it should be uh, it should be a great conversation. We'll of course have links to what you're up to and your information more about uh, Siemens and what you're about. And I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, my great pleasure. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. And we'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. See you, everybody.